Hello, good morning, and uh, I would like first of all to thank the organizers of the World Congress for this kind invitation to share my thought about cardiopulmonary bypass. And so this is, a, of course, a complex item, and uh, I will try to stress some of the main aspects that we have been addressing uh, in the recent past. This is my disclosure of lies. And I will concentrate basically on three apparently simple things. One is pressure, the other one is peripheral resistances, and the final one is the flow during cardiopulmonary bypass. So going to the pressure, uh, I will basically uh, stick to the guidelines that we very recently produced at the level of the uh, Society of Cardiac Surgery, the European Society of Cardiac Anesthesia and the European Board for Cardiopulmonary Bypass. The, the recommendation that we forwarded is that we should keep the blood pressure during CPB uh, within a range uh, between 50 and 8 millimeters of mercury. And for doing this, of course, we should first of all check and adjust the depth of anesthesia. Uh, we should uh, assume that the target pump flow is correct. Uh, but if these conditions are satisfied, then, of course, we should use vasodilators or vasoconstrictors to maintain the blood pressure within this range. However, we strongly uh, recommend not to use vasopressor to force the mean arterial pressure values higher than 80 millimeters of mercury. And this is basically coming from a, a very important study that has been recently published in circulation and this is a randomized control trial where uh, the patients were randomized into a low target group and a high target group. And basically, the uh, primary outcome was a total volume of new ischemic lesions expressed as a difference between the, the uh, diffusion weighted MRI conducted preoperatively and again between three days three and six after surgery. And then there was a secondary outcome that was a total number of new ischemic cerebral lesions. So the patients were allocated to the low target or the high target group. Uh, basically, the first one has a, had a target mean arterial pressure of 40 to 50 and the other one of 70 to 80. Uh, this, of course, with an intended fixed equal and non pulsatile blood flow of 2.4 liters per minute per square meter. So to the group targeted to a high level of pressure uh, was basically treated with intravenous donors of vas vasoconstrictors uh, if there was not a spontaneous blood pressure within the target range. Uh, in the low target group, no vasodilatory drugs were administered. So basically, the intraoperative management uh, was similar with the only exception, of course, that the norepinephrine infusion was a seven times higher in the high target group, and the patients receiving norepinephrine were something like close to 100% in the high target group, and only 35% in the low target group. Going to the outcome, uh, there were no differences in the primary outcome, but actually, if you look at the rate of stroke, then you can see that in the high target group, there was something like 7% stroke and only 1% in the low target group with a p-value of 0 0.06. And even mortality was 4% uh, in the high target group and 0 in the low target group. And again, there is a 0 0.6. So a trend towards a worse outcome in people who were treated with vasoconstrictors uh, aiming to achieve a, a high blood pressure. There are other studies that are providing conflicting uh, results. But basically, uh, the great majority had biases in the design. And so uh, I think that this study is the one that probably we should keep into consideration. Then, of course, we, when we speak about pressure and when we consider the flow as a constant, uh, all the game is played at the level of the peripheral resistances. And to this respect, I would like to address the problem of the so-called vasoplegic syndrome. That is something that is quite common. We will see 
how much is the rate of this uh, syndrome. Uh, so we address this, recommending that the vasoplegic syndrome during CDB should be treated with vasoconstrictors, basically alpha-1 adrenergic agonists. If the patient is refractory to this first-line therapy, then we should look for alternative vasopressors like vasopressin, terlipressin, or methylene blau. And there is even some uh, report, basically, case report or case series, uh, with the use of hydroxycobalamin in patients that are refractory to the use of other vasopressors. So what we know about this disease is that actually the incidence is ranging between 5 and 25%. So it's, uh, it's a lot. And uh, it's probably accompanied even by worse outcomes in terms especially of uh, renal problems and other major complications and maybe even mortality. If we want to measure this uh, syndrome, uh, we should look at the area under the core of the target blood pressure. And the higher it is, the more the patient is susceptible to this syndrome. The risk factors are basically the preoperative use of ACE inhibitors, the preoperative use of beta blockers, so very common, commonly used drug in cardiac surgery, but even a high euro score, a preoperative hemodynamic instability may play a role, and especially the valve procedures, mainly mitral valve procedures, seems to be more frequently accompanied by this syndrome. So as I mentioned before, the treatment of this uh, syndrome is based on phenylephrine, norepinephrine, vasopressin, and methylene blau in this uh, logical order. And even the intravenous hydroxycobalamin, as I mentioned, was proposed in patients that were resistant even to methylene blau. Finally, the flow. Flow is probably the most important thing that we should uh, taking consideration when we are dealing with cardiopulmonary bypass. The first thing is that if we look at the type of perfusion, that means pulsatile perfusion or non-pulsatile perfusion, then if you look at all the randomized control trials, they are all in favor of pulsatile flow, especially for the reduction of pulmonary and renal complications. So, we suggest that this should be considered in patients at high risk for others, lung and renal outcomes. But, however, we are very aware of the fact that basically uh, still pulsatile perfusion is uh, practiced in a very, very low rate of patients. And the, the common way is non pulsatile perfusion. And when it comes to the pump flow management during CPB, of course, in class one, we place the fact that we should, first of all, determine the correct blood flow based on the body surface area and the plant temperature. But once we do this, we should look for the adequacy of the pump flow. That means for that specific patient, it's no more something that is uh, tailored for everyone. So we look at the parameters of that specific patient we make it a tailored approach, looking at a number of metabolic parameters like the SVO2, oxygen extraction rate, near infrared spectroscopy, and even carbon dioxide production and the level of blood, arterial blood lactase. An important point is that we should consider the oxygen delivery and we should maintain the level uh, at a mean value of more or less 280 milliliters per minute per square meter. And this is coming from a number of studies. This was produced by my group about 15 years ago, uh, when we first look at the oxygen delivery during cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, searching for an association with acute renal failure after surgery. So we actually measure a number of indices and we could find that there was an association between renal failure and the pump flow, the lowest hematocrit on CPB, and more importantly, the lowest oxygen delivery under CPB. 
So you see that the greatest association is found for the oxygen delivery. And looking for prediction, we could identify a level of 272 milliliters minute per square meters as a cutoff level for renal failure with a sensitivity and specificity close to 70%. In patients who were treated with a high oxygen delivery, they had actually uh, a very low rate of renal dysfunction in comparison with patients that were treated with a low oxygen delivery, even in case of a high hematoma. So the pump flow is important, especially if we have a low hematoma to maintain the oxygen delivery. Then the study was repeated in other institutions, uh, and we could confirm this finding in other places, in London, in Ghent, and actually in 2011, we uh, invented this term that nowadays is quite common, that is the goal-directed perfusion during cardiac pulmonary bypass, GDP. Again, we could measure the hematocrit, the DO2, and even the carbon dioxide production. And again, we could confirm that there was an association with acute kidney injury, stage one or stage two, or any kind of acute kidney injury. And again, we found a cut of level at around 260 milliliters per minute per square meters. And again, again, those who were treated with a DO2 higher than this cutoff level had values of acute kidney injury that were something like three to four times lower than patients who were treated with a, a low oxygen delivery. Then the final step was actually doing the randomized control trial. This is the so-called goal-directed perfusion trial, the GIFT study, a multicenter randomized control trial that we published about four to five years ago. Then here we could randomize uh, about 330 patients to receive uh, a goal-directed perfusion or a standard perfusion during cardiopulmonary bypass. And basically, the goal-directed perfusion was aimed to reach and maintain a value of oxygen delivery higher than 280 milliliters. So you see here that actually this was done. The two groups were different in terms of uh, the DO2 during cardiopulmonary bypass with a higher level in the GDP arm. And the number of patients with the DO2 lower than the target value was significantly lower in the GDP R. So going to the primary endpoint, we could demonstrate that actually patients in the gold directed perfusion arm had significantly lower rate of acute kidney injury stage one, and basically of even of any kind of acute kidney injury, with a rate of acute kidney injury stage one that was 50% lower than in the control arm. So having said this, I think that there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, and basically, I think that uh, we should probably reconsider the role of pulsatile perfusion. And uh, I thank you all for your attention.